Hello everyone. Let's begin our lecture today with what is economics? Chapter 1-1 Scarcity and the Science of Economics. You know, you may wonder if the study of economics is even worth your time and effort, but you'll be surprised that it actually helps a lot of us in many ways, especially in our roles as individuals and members of our community and global citizenship. The good news is that economics is not just useful, it can be interesting as well. Don't be surprised to find out that the time you spend on this topic will be well spent. We begin by actually going over a very simple word, a simple word known as scarcity. Now, what does scarcity mean? Well, scarcity, you have to understand, is the fundamental economic problem facing all societies. What happens, it results from a combination of a scarce number of resources and people's virtual unlimited wants and needs. For example, someone without a home may want a small one. One with a small home may want a larger one. One with a large home may want a mansion. Whether they're rich or poor, most people want more than they already have. Why is it that you're not driving around in a Porsche? Well... Maybe because many of us don't have a resource to purchase that Porsche car. What resource am I talking about? Money. Yes, this class, as much as I told you, is not about money. Well, it's not about money in the financial sense you may think. It's about money as a resource. Many of us want to go out every Saturday night and purchase lobster and crab and caviar but why is it that we don't have that? We may want it, but we won't possess it because we don't have the resource known as money. Why? Because it's scarce. And that condition is known as scarcity. And when we study how we as people try to deal with that situation, that is known as economics. So again, Scarcity is the condition that results from society not having enough resources to produce all the things we would like. But economics is the study of how we deal with that situation, how we deal with that condition. Our needs and wants. What is a need? Well, a need is a basic requirement. We know that. We, we know since elementary that a need is like food, clothing, shelter, a want. Well, a brand new fishing rod, a brand new fishing reel, a brand new iPad, the brand new Apple Watch, an iPhone, iPhone with Verizon service. These, are, of course, are all wants. But they're also something else. They're also goods and services. And goods and services are very useful and relatively scarce and transferable to others. Let's begin talking about goods. Well, goods come in many different forms. Just keep this in mind. A good is always going to be tangible. Aye, right, Mr. Jimenez, you're already going to start using big words? Yes, what I mean by tangible, it means it can be touched. You can touch it. You can hold it in your hand. You can get into it. You can walk into it, of course, a home. Uh, you can do pretty much, you can, you know, a, a tangible Item is anything, you know, is physical. That is physical. So a good is a physical item, a tangible item. And, of course, based on their use, we will categorize them, such as a durable good. And a durable good, of course, is one that lasts three or more years when used on a regular basis, such as factories, tractors, uh, robot welders, um, anything that's going to, of course, like the word says, be durable. A non-durable good is something that perishes. It doesn't last very long. Okay? It, the most, if anything, is three years. Of course, food is very perishable. Writing paper can be very perishable or non-durable. And most clothing items don't last more than three years, so they are categorized as non-durable. Then you have... The two different types of actual, the way they, in another sense, relate to human beings. Are they a consumer good or a capital good? Well, first of all, what is a consumer good versus a capital good? 
A consumer good is a good intended for a final use for individuals, such as a shirt, a donut, a piece of chick fried chicken, a pizza. All these are intended as a final use for us. However, a capital good is a good that is used to make consumer goods. Okay? So when thinking of the chicken and the egg, and I know that's not a very good example, the chicken is actually the capital good because the chicken's going to make the egg, which is the egg is going to be the consumer good. If you're going to crack that egg open and makes an omelet, the relationship there would be that the chicken was the capital good and the egg was the consumer good. However, what if I put this to you now? What if I put this to you now? Uh, the chicken, but in the sense of fried chicken. Okay, so the chicken now becomes the consumer good because that's going to be the final good. Well, once it's fried up, wait a minute. Okay, I got it, sir. Okay, so a capital good produces a consumer good. A consumer good is the final good. That's the one we're going to use when we are consumers. Exactly. When do you use capital goods? When you're a producer. When you produce something, you're using a capital good to produce a consumer good. Now, when we're talking about producing, frying up chicken, maybe cutting hair, maybe mowing the lawn for a client, uh, or even what I'm doing now, teaching, what we're talking about now is we're talking about servicing, service. A service is, of course, the other type of economic product. This is work that is performed for someone by someone. And of course, services include home repairs, uh, some type of form of entertainment like Jay-Z playing a concert, Beyonce playing a concert. This also includes all the work that is done by us, teachers, lawyers, doctors. The difference between a good and a service is a good is tangible, whereas something that is a service is not tangible. This you cannot touch. You cannot touch a hair. You cannot touch someone cutting your hair. That's it's intangible. You cannot touch someone mowing your lawn, the landscaper coming to your home and mowing your lawn. You cannot touch this, what I'm doing right now, the teaching. It's intangible. It, you can't touch it. Okay. That's what a service is. So the difference between a good and a service is one's tangible and the other's intangible. So again, a good would be tangible. A uh, service would be intangible. Most goods and services actually have something called value, which refers to the worth that they can be expressed in dollars and cents. Why would anything have value? Why are things sometimes more valuable than others? To answer this, we'll have to review a problem that Adam Smith revealed when he faced it back in 1776. This problem is known as the paradox of value. The paradox of value. Philosophers have talked about the value for hundreds of years, but they were unable to explain the concept satisfactorily. They were puzzled by the fact that some necessities, such as water, had a very low monetary value. On the other hand, some non-necessities, such as diamonds, had a high value. This contradiction, ladies and gentlemen, right here, is known as the paradox of value. Adam Smith, actually he's known as the father of economics, was the first one to explain this paradox in his famous book, The Wealth of Nations, published in 1776. I just thought I'd throw this in there real quick, but Adam Smith, the father of economics, famous economist and philosopher, you can read more about it in this slide. I won't go too much detail into the slide, but you can read about him. But here's a fun fact. He was actually kidnapped by gypsies at three years old. He was absent-minded and often talked to himself. He was the first Scotsman on the English banknote in 2007. If you don't know what gypsies are, it's kind of people who just roam around the land. I guess they found him playing on a field one day and they just decided, you know what? Let's just go ahead and kidnap the young man. At three years old, right? Ugh. All right. Well, let's continue explaining what he argued for. 
What he argued for was this. Adam Smith argued that for something to have value that can be expressed in monetary terms, it must be scarce and have something known as utility. Utility. What is utility? It is the capacity to be useful and provide satisfaction. In other words, you know that moment that you bite into that slice of pizza or you take that first spoonful of cereal in the morning or you bite into that wing that you bought at Wing Daddy's? You know how it feels really good? It tastes really good. It's the one thing you've been wanting all day. Well, that, ladies and gentlemen, is utility right there. Utility is when something provides you with satisfaction. That's what utility is. Utility is just another word for the word satisfaction. Okay? Utility is not fixed or measurable. It's not. Like weight or height. Instead, utility of a good or service may vary from one person to the next. Because you might enjoy that bowl of cereal. I might not. It may have a great value of utility for you. But for me, it doesn't. So, therefore, utility differs and cannot be measured. So Adam Smith, again, he argued that for something to have value, it can be expressed in monetary terms and must be scarce and have utility. Therefore, this is the solution to the paradox of value. Diamonds are scarce and have utility. Therefore, they possess a value that cannot be stated in monetary terms. Whereas water has utility, but it is not scarce enough in most places to give it much value. Therefore, water is less expensive or has less monetary value than diamonds. You know, the emphasis on monetary value is important to economists. It is. However, unlike moral or social values, which is the topic of other social sciences, the value of something in terms of dollars and cents is a concept that everyone can easily understand, to be honest with you. To the idea of wealth. In economics, when we begin to discuss wealth, well, what wealth is, is another important concept. In an economic sense, wealth is the accumulation of products that are tangible, scarce, have utility, and can be transferred from one person to another. A nation's wealth compromises all tangible items, including natural resources, factories, stores, houses, motels, theaters, furniture, clothing, books, highways, video games, and even basketballs. All this can be exchanged. So let me ask you something. When we're dealing with wealth and what we just listened to, if I were to tell you that we, you and I lived out on a farm, you had two chickens and I had three goats, would you consider us to be wealthy? Good question, right? I believe the answer to that question is yes, we are. Because we both have items that have, they are tangible, they are scarce, and they have utility because they're sources of food. And can we transfer them from one person to another? Of course we can. I can ask you for two chickens and I will give you one goat. So they can be exchanged. So they do qualify as being wealth. Why don't you take a moment right now and think to yourself, what else can be wealth? What else can be considered wealth? Pause the video. So pause the video and think about it. When you're ready, unpause the video and continue on. So now, wealth. While goods are counted as well, services are not because they are intangible. Now, it doesn't mean that services are not used for valuable. In his book in 1776, Adam Smith was referring specifically to the abilities and skills of a nation's people as a source of its wealth. For Smith, if a country's material possessions were taken away, its people through the efforts and skills could restore these possessions. Now, on the other hand, if a country's people were taken away, its wealth would deteriorate. Think about it. It's so simple. Listen, listen, listen to my example. Let me see if you understand my example a little bit better. I want you to 
I want you to imagine an island known as Utopia. And on this island known as Utopia, people thrive, they succeed. Civilization's doing excellent. They're a agricultural base, okay? So what does that mean? Their economy is based on agriculture. Corn, wheat, uh, grain, uh, also farm animals, cows, goats, and all that good stuff, right? Okay, Hurricane, Hurricane Abbott Smith comes and wipes out all the crops and kills a lot of the animals. Some animals survive, but it kills a good portion of uh, farm animals, but it wipes out 100% of the crops. Okay, can the people of Utopia rebuild? Think about it. Can the people of Utopia rebuild? If you answered yes, they can, sir, all they have to do is harvest again. And the little animals that survived will reproduce other little animals or farm animals. And in time, they'll have the same amount of animals. But the only reason they also were able to reproduce the animals was because the people were there to assist with the reproduction of animals. So again, for the animals to have reproduced, because if not, they would have gone sick without people being there, taking care of them, feeding them. They would have gone sick. They would not have been able to feed themselves because the crops were gone, you know. Um, so the people needed to be there, right? Okay. Okay. Now, instead of a hurricane, now we have a plague. And this plague wipes out all the human race from the land of Utopia. Every single human dies on Utopia. Can Utopia rebuild? It's not going to be able to rebuild, isn't it? It's not going to be able to rebuild because the people don't exist anymore. The people are not there to harvest the new crops. The people are not there to care for the animals. So eventually the animals will die. As long as the people do not return, Utopia will suffer and eventually become non-existent. So I know my metaphor, my analogy wasn't very good, but what I was trying to tell you is Adam Smith's book argues that the wealth of a nation is its people. Without the people, nothing can continue on successfully in any land, any territory, any country, any nation. Well, I hope you understood what I was trying to say. <laughs> Moving on. Let's start talking about Tin Staffel. The problem of scarcity has another important consequence. Because resources are limited, everything we do, ladies and gentlemen, has a cost. Even when it seems as if we're getting something for free, it's not, guys. I mean, do you really ever get a free meal when you use a buy one, get one coupon? No, you don't. And the reason for that is that the business has already given up some type of monetary resource to pay for the resources that went into that meal that you're gonna, you think you're getting for free. So it usually recovers these costs by actually charging more for its other products. So in the end, you may actually be the one who pays for the free lunch. Most things in life are not free, ladies and gentlemen, because someone has already had to pay for producing them in the first place, okay? You know how when people talk about a free lunch at school? It's not free. The taxpayers have already paid for the food. Uh, the district paid for the food. Someone's already paid for it. It's just that it's free for you, but it's not free for someone else. Economists use the term tin staffel, which means there's no such thing as a free lunch. Why don't you go ahead and take a moment and think about something that you thought was free, but now that you understand the concept of tin staffel, now you understand, oh, whoa, wait, you're right. Someone had already paid for this. Pause the video, think about it. And then maybe in class you can share it. Okay, 
Moving on to questions all societies face. Because we live in a world of relatively scarce resources, we have to make careful choices about the way we use the resources. In addition to the origin of scarcity, it also presents three basic questions we need to answer as we make these choices. Question number one, what to produce? Question number two, how to produce it? Question number three, for whom to produce? Let's, be, let's begin looking at these very critical questions, beginning with the first question, what to produce? So for example, should a society direct most of its resources to production of military equipment or to other items such as food, clothing, or housing? Suppose the decision to produce housing should the limited resources be used to build low income, middle income, or upper income housing? A society cannot produce everything its people want, so it must decide what to produce. And in some countries, this is actually decided by the government. For example, in North Korea, the government has almost complete control over this decision. As a result, large quantities of military goods are produced rather than consumer goods for the people. But in the United States, who decides what to produce? Spending decisions are actually made by the consumers, largely determine the answer to what to produce question. And how is that done? It's a little known concept known as supply and demand. We'll be covering that soon. A second question is how to produce. Should factory owners use automated production methods that require more machines and fewer workers? Or should they use fewer machines and more workers? If a community has many unemployed people, using more workers might actually be better, don't you think? However, on the other hand, in countries where machinery is widely available, automation can often lower production costs. Lowering costs might actually manufactured items less expensive and therefore more available to people. You know, Japan and Mexico provide a really good example of this concept. In Japan, more than half of the population is older than 45 years of age. With relatively fewer young people working, they actually have highly automated factories that require fewer workers. In Mexico though, however, the population is much younger. So production techniques rely less on automation with robots and use people instead. So I need you to just step back a moment and think about that. Where you don't have very many young people were capable, capable of working, automation was better. Yet where we you have a younger population, such as Mexico, it's actually better to have less automation and more people working. Wow, you see how they're so different because of the people who exist in this land? What does that reinforce? Whose theory does that reinforce? Adam Smith's, that the people are the most valuable resource to a country. Depending on the age group, that in itself will have an effect on how to produce. Good, guys. Very good concept connection there. Moving on to the third question. For whom to produce? After a society decides what and how to produce, it must decide who will receive the things produced. If a society decides to produce housing, for example, should it be the kind of housing that is wanted by low-income workers, middle-income professional people, or the very rich? If there are not enough houses for everyone, a society is going to have to make a choice about who will receive the existing supply. These questions concerning what, how, and for whom to produce are never easy for any society to answer. Nevertheless, they must be answered as long as there are not enough resources to satisfy people's seemingly unlimited wants and needs. Uh-oh. Stop for a quick brain check. What is that concept known as? What's the concept known as when there isn't enough resources to go around to satisfy everybody's wants and needs? If you answered scarcity, 
You are correct. What is it known when we study the condition of scarcity as a science? If you said economics, great job, guys. Scarcity is the concept that we are not, there's not enough resources to go around to satisfy everybody's needs and wants. And when we study this condition of scarcity and how people react to that condition, that's known as economics. Good job, guys. Moving on. So again, the scope of economics. Economics is a study of human effort to satisfy seemingly unlimited and competing wants through the careful use of relatively scarce resources. Economics is also a social science because it deals with the behavior of people as they deal with the basic issue. What basic issue? This basic issue. The four key elements of this study are description, analysis, explanation, and prediction. These are just some of the things that all economists will do in their life. I have done them and other economists have done them. One part of economics describes the economic activity, such as something we'll learn a little later known as GDP and gross domestic product. This is the monetary value of all final goods and services and structures produced when the country's border in a 12 month period. GDP is the most comprehensive measure of a country's total output. It, it's a key measure of a nation's economic wealth. Economics also describes jobs, prices, trade, taxes, and government spending. This description allows us to know what the world looks like. I've even produced a small little map of the United States and I provided you the understanding of what? Well, the GDPs of various countries throughout the world in comparison to the GDP of a state. Who, from looking at this image, who has the same GDP as Texas? If you answered Mexico, you are correct. Who has the same GDP as the state of Washington? If you answered Venezuela, you are correct. Who has the same GDP as Switzerland? If you answered Florida, you are correct. You mean, sir, these states have the same measure of output as these countries you have labeled on here? Yes. Wow. So the United States must have a huge GDP. We do. Our current GDP is $19.8 trillion. That's great, sir. Aren't we rich? There's a slight problem with that. And let me describe it to you if you can. Here's the problem, guys. Our GDP is about... 19 trillion, right? However, the amount of money we owe currently is 23 trillion. So with the, all the money, all the wealth, all the country's measurement of total output that we have in one year, about 19.8 trillion, can we pay off what we owe every year, which is about 21 to 22 trillion dollars? Is it? So you understand. It's like trying to ask you. Every month you have to pay your bills. And every month you get paid from your work. Every month you get paid $100. And with those $100 you have to pay off your bills, right? Okay. So with that said, get ready to pay your bills. Here we go. Here comes the monthly bill. $150. Uh-oh, SpaghettiOs, what happened? Well, you actually owe more than what you made, right? So now you owe $50 and those $50 are gonna carry over to the next month's bill. So instead of owing 150 next month, you're gonna owe what? 200, but you still only get paid 100. So then the next month you're gonna owe 100 plus what you owe for that month. So you're gonna owe 250, but you still only make 100. What's going on here? What's wrong with this picture? You are spending more than what you make. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the United States economy. Yep. Uh, I went ahead and made the image a little larger for you to go ahead and take a look and analyze and compare the state's GDP 
with other countries' GDP. So you're telling me, sir, that Nigeria and Minnesota have the same GDP? That's correct. Minnesota and Nigeria have the same GDP. Another image you can take a look at. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm comparing our country's GDP to other countries. So you can see a proportional GDP map of the world. So by looking at this map and analyzing it, who can you tell me has the largest GDP in the world? If you said the United States of America, you're correct. Very good. Take a look at all the other GDPs as they proportionalize to the United States. Moving on. Economics also analyzes the economic activity that it describes. Why, for example, are the prices of some items higher than others? You know, you go to the store and you look at some of these items and you're like, why is this more expensive than this? Why do some people earn higher incomes than others? Why does she or make more money than I do? How do taxes affect people's desire to work and save? When analyzing primary sources or secondary sources, a scientist, an economist, take into account the bias of the author. After accounting for that source, author's individual point of view, you're more likely to provide an accurate analysis of the evidence. Economics also involves explanation. After economists analyze a problem and understand why and how things work, well, they need to communicate this knowledge to others. Like all scientists, this explanation should be based in careful research that properly attributes ideas to source material so that other economists can evaluate and duplicate the work for accuracy. If we all have a common understanding of the way the economy works, some economic problems will be easier to address or fix in the future. When it comes to GDP, you will soon discover that economists spend much of their time explaining why the measure is or is not performing in the manner than expected. Finally, economics is concerned with prediction. For example, we may want to know whether our income will rise or fall in the near future. Will I pay more taxes? Will I pay less taxes? Because economists is the study of both what is happening and what tends to happen, it can help predict what may happen in the future, including the most likely effects of different actions. The study of economics helps us become more informed citizens and better decision makers. Because of this, it is important that you realize that good economic choices are the responsibility of all citizens in a free and democratic society. By the way, a summary of economics deals with all these questions and some and sometimes even more. It's also a dynamic science in that the subject it studies, individuals such as ourselves and the economy as a whole, are always changing. Fortunately, the methods and the tools, the graphs and the models of the economy are well suited to this task. This is something that economists in a certain amount of confidence when explaining or describing events, and we hope it gives you confidence as well. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes my lecture on scarcity and the science of economics. Thank you.